We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's a, a great pleasure for me to be here with you today to the next agenda point of the Internet Governance Forum 2021 in Poland, in Katowice, high-level plenary panel, investing in digital growth and enabling capacities. My name is Krzysztof Schubert and I will be having the pleasure to moderate this session. This is a very special occasion for us as for the very first time Poland is organizing the official 16th edition of Internet Governance Forum as well as having with us today on site leading decision makers in the field of digital transformation. Today you will hear directly from, from them. We are very lucky in our panel that we have all the panelists on site with us on the stage. So we are really, really very happy and really appreciated that you are together with us on the stage. And uh, let's give a warm welcome to Ms. Huria Ali Mahdi, State Minister of Innovation and Technology, Ethiopia. Ms. Teresa Czerwińska, Vice President, European Investment Bank. Ms. Maria Francesca Spatoliziano, Interim Head of Office, United Nations Office. Mr. Henry Verdier, French Ambassador for Digital Technology. And Mr. Viktor Smakarov, Special Envoy on Digital Issues at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Latvia. There will be as well a short video message in the second part of the meeting from Mr. Dmitry Chernyshenko, Deputy Prime Minister, Russian Federation, the 2025 uh, host country. Ladies and gentlemen, th th there is no doubt that uh, digital transformation, including regulation, as well as investment and funding are today the most important topics. Digital transformation is a complex uh, process that carries enormous potential for human development and economic growth, but it's not free of challenges. The current pandemic has changed a lot of negative effects, especially for businesses. Many of them have had a face to face a new virtual reality. According to the World Bank's report, prepared in cooperation with Polish Agency for Enterprise Development, as a result of pandemic, 32% of the Polish companies started to use or increase the use of internet uh, in the end. Social media, specialized application or digital platforms for businesses are as well very much present. What enterprises improved in this way was mainly sales 45%, marketing 38%, management 24%. Public administration also seen a major acceleration. SMEs, not necessary. So I would like to start with a very open question to all our speakers. Based on your experience and perspective, what are the challenges in terms of digital transformation for the years to come? And what areas will require, if any, regulatory intervention? Such the time is very limited and we have a number of um, distinguished speakers. Please be so kind and limit your intervention to maximum three, four minutes. Let me give the floor to Ms. Huria Almahdi, State Minister of Innovation and Technology, Ethiopia. So maybe I will handle the voice to me. Yes? OK. <laughs> yeah, so the floor is yours, Minister. Thank you. Have you started the question? Can you? Yes. Um, based on your experience and perspective, what are the challenges in terms of digital transformation for the years to come? From your perspective, your personal feelings or opinions, and what, are, what areas will require, if any, regulatory intervention? 
Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Okay, as you know, uh, digital transformation is a journey, but the journey in its nature, it's dynamic, fast, and requires multi-stakeholder uh, involvement. So any effort should recognize this very nature digital transformation. For example, when uh, my country or Ethiopia government designed its first digital uh, strategy, 2025, digital transformation strategy, the strategy highlighted the need to urgent, bold, and cooperation action to make the digital transformation successful. Because if we are not manage the uh, digital technology, advanced proactive, it can significantly impede or to a nation out of development opportunity. Like, for example, lack of infrastructure, which includes connectivity and power, cyber security, digital literacy, lack of legal frameworks pose the challenges for the digital transformation journey. The other important factor is we lack a new mindset and the uh, leadership, lack of leadership style from governance side. So it will be impossible to leverage digital opportunity or transformation without the commitment of the leadership and coming with a new mindset. So it needs to have uh, a new mindset and commitment on the leadership. The other thing is also failing to understand the complexity of the digital ecosystem among the policymakers and stakeholders to address the challenges and explore the opportunities in challenge. So I believe failing to address this issue could be a challenge for digital transformation. Regardless of the regulatory intervention, as you know, digital transformation needs vibrant technology, entrepreneurship ecosystem, and the ecosystem requires enabling policies, regulations that impress innovation and technology allow tech entrepreneur and thrive. So if we take our experience adapting innovative and consultative approach to policymakers, designing stronger governance coordination, multi-stakeholder uh, multi engagement, introducing new regulatory solutions for investment in doing businesses, and reversing procurements, telecom sector regulations are some regulatory interventions that our digital information strategy identifies regular uh, regulatory information these are the challenges we face uh, thank you minister uh, thank you minister for giving us an insight into Ethiopia perspective it's it's really important that you have mentioned a few times the multi-stakeholder approach which is really very important especially that you will be hosting the IGF 2020 to 23 in the following year, so it's, it's really very, very important. Now I will turn over to Ms. Teresa Czerwińska, Vice President, European Investment Bank. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And let me start with a warm thank you to the organizers uh, for this uh, kind invitation. It's a great pleasure to represent the European Investment Bank uh, at uh, this very, very distinguished forum, uh, the European Investment Bank, the EU Climate Bank, uh, and our EIB group uh, comprises the European Investment Bank and the European Investment Fund, and we are the biggest uh, multilateral financial institution in the world uh, and one of the largest providers of financing in areas of uh, climate, innovation, and digitalization with around 77 billion euros uh, invested in projects uh, every year around the world. So we believe events like today's are urgently important, um, particularly because uh, the economic recovery is still vastly uncertain and digitalization is 
the key factor which uh, can mitigate uh, this uncertainty. So we are happy to bring our experience to, to this debate and, and to show our, our, our experience at the forum. Uh, in our view, um, there are at least uh, two major challenges for digital transformation to fully exploit this uh, tremendous potential. And those are, from our perspective, first, the existing enormous digitalization gap between Europe and other major economies, and second, uh, the uneven intensity of digitalization across regions and sectors in Europe and beyond. And let me today share with you um, European perspective of these issues, uh, yet many of, partner, of patterns uh, can be easily found uh, in other in regions around the world. So on digitalization gap, um, uh, today we are talking that uh, uh, pivotal role of digitalization is enabler of innovation and sustainable growth implies large investment needs in the years to come and the EU still underinvests the ICT sector uh, in comparison with other major economies um, uh, as uh, the US and Japan. According to the latest estimates, uh, the digitalization gap uh, between Europe and other major economies uh, is assessed uh, at the level of 1% of GDP uh, annually. So it's quite a substantial gap in financing we are observing. Uh, it is why for us it's obvious that demand for green uh, technologies and digitally enabled products and services will be important grow engines in coming years and decades. But what we need for digital and uh, green transformation, um, uh, we need uh, some kind of structural shifts and it requires extremely large investment programs. This is why collaboration between public and, pl and private players is so much needed to close this substantial investment gap. Uh, of course, uh, the digitalization gap is uh, not the only concern. The EU shows substantial evaluation in digitalization intensity across regions, sector, sectors, as well as um, individual firms. And on the regional level, among companies in Eastern and Southern Europe, digitalization is uh, particularly low, well below uh, the EU average. And those regions require special attention uh, to ensure that all EU member states can truly benefit from the upcoming uh, investment programs. To address this investment gap uh, uh, in the CEE region, uh, particularly uh, the European Commission together with uh, the EIB group, EBRD and World Bank group have launched um, digital innovation and scale up initiative and we as uh, the uh, EIB group we are leading uh, this exercise and more and uh, supervising so all in all uh, such collaborative efforts are true enablers for the twin transition green and digital and uh, all in all coming back to your question what uh, are the main challenges i think uh, to be tackled uh, by international community uh, digital digital gap in financing uh, and also uh, this uh, very big variety among sectors and among regions uh, in digital intensity it, it, Thank you, Ms. President. It was a really very interesting uh, a perspective from the European Investment Bank, also touching a bit of the financial side, and we will back to that later on as well. It's a very important topic. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Maria Francesca Spatoliziano, Interim Head Office, United Nations Office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Technology, to share her thoughts on digital transformation, answer the same question and your perspective. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to have this great uh, audience, uh, both uh, online, virtually, and in presence uh, to, to discuss these important, crucial themes. This morning in the opening session, we all heard from uh, uh, the leaders uh, of Poland and uh, the Under Secretary General uh, uh, in UN DESA how important, of course, is to address uh, the um, opportunities that are given to us by these new technologies and to be mindful of the challenges and the risks. So, so I will not repeat that kind of premise, but it is very important to keep it in mind. Why? Because at the UN, of course, we, we are set to do our best to support countries and globally so that these new tools are used for the good of people, for a people-centered progress to reduce the inequalities that exist and have been exacerbated during this pandemic within countries, among countries, thanks to the opportunities, thanks to these new digital tools, and to avert the risks and the challenges or reduce or minimize those risks and challenges which come with the new tools. So that is uh, the, the overall objective I wanted to put in front of you first. The technologies, of course, will more and more determine the economic pathways of countries, big and small, you know, advanced and, and less advanced. So we, we really need to have a, a framework, we believe, at the UN, a global framework, which happens to be you know, already starting in several places, a regulatory framework you asked about, many, many rules exist, whether they are set by uh, official institutions or in practice by private actors, many rules exist. The question is whether they are the right rules, the good rules, which will help us to progress together and for people to have, you know, their dignity respected online as it is offline, for uh, uh, them to be able to seize the opportunities in the new employment and job markets and these kind of things. So what do we need? We need, of course, uh, infrastructures. We need access to the infrastructures. We need skilled people to be able to be users of all this and to do all this, as the president of the AB said, uh, we need investment to support all this. We, we can... Uh, um, you know, um, see, refer to the European Union who has started, and I have here uh, uh, um, honorable representatives, have started to set some proposals about regulating the digital market and digital services. And, uh, and that is a very welcome development which can inspire uh, uh, others. Um, of course, there are when we talk about regulations, we have to define a little bit what we want to regulate for what purpose. So it's not just a blanket uh, approach. Um, and there are uh, um, different levels. Some uh, regulations will be uh, adopted at the national uh, level, of course, or regional level. But we believe, as UN, that the um, uh, area we are talking about, new technology, the internet, uh, calls for a global approach. And so we offer, of course, the platform uh, of the UN as a place where these debates can um, be developed in a, in a global uh, way and bring uh, possibly consensus uh, over uh, the, the core principles we need in these regulations. And um, as you know, the Secretary General has uh, presented a roadmap for technological cooperation and uh, the Office of the Tech Envoy is uh, busy with uh, uh, the membership and the multi-stakeholder community to implement the pillars of that uh, vision, and, um, which is for an open, free, and safe, secure internet for all. Uh, other entities of the UN, like UNESCO, have started uh, putting the basis for, say, some principles in the area of uh, artificial intelligence. Other, like ITU, are working on connectivity. I mean, the whole uh, constellation of the UN entities uh, has uh, started working on implementing these principles. And uh, um, let me add one more thing, which is that... Um, 
In September, the Secretary General presented his vision uh, in a report called Our Common Agenda, and in that one, you have the um, cross-cutting theme of uh, uh, technology, people-centered uh, digital transformation. And uh, also in that document, we have uh, uh, the ambition, we have set the ambition to, to reach uh, uh, what we call a global digital compact in the year 2023. And I will come back to that uh, in a second round maybe and tell you a little bit more about it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Francesca, for sharing your views and experiences. It's really important that you have mentioned the, the regulation because we are just uh, in front of discussing the regulations on the European level. We have the acts like uh, DSA, DMA, Digital Market Act, Digital Services Act, concerning also discussions on the platforms and the future in that sense of the internet and the, and the freedom of, of, of doing businesses and being on, um, online. Now I would like to ask uh, Mr. Henry Verdier, French ambassador for the digital technology. And uh, Mr. Ambassador, you have quite a bit experience as we discussed yesterday, also from the entrepreneur side, so it would be really interesting to see your perspective and what French people are thinking about that and where they are going. Thank you, Minister. I suggest you to take your devices because I will speak French. Et je vais parler français, d'abord parce que nous sommes accueillis par l'ONU et nous avons une, une traduction de très grande qualité que je remercie. The quality of the interpreting service is excellent because we are hosted by the UN, so I'd like to thank the interpreters. But since we're discussing the digital transformation, I think it's important to make sure that we can all speak about the values we uphold and we want a diversity of voices to be heard. To answer your question, let me share a simple thought with you. 50 years ago, somebody who had a vision invented the internet. The internet became the greatest platform of innovation for humanity. It became the greatest platform enabling economic growth. It was a huge dream, and it has become something that has changed the world. Today, we need to face important challenges. The first challenge is the digital divide and inequalities in terms of access to internet artificial intelligence, and other aspects. Public data, education models, and artificial intelligence. There is another risk, there is another threat, which is related to cyber security or cyber crime. There are states and actors who attack digital infrastructure. Let us also mention that specific business models are becoming degenerated. Fake news abounds on social media. Very often, there are certain economic models that will need to be regulated, but regulations must be developed in cooperation with representatives of major sectors of the economy. So to answer your question, Minister, let me tell you that we need to develop good regulations that will respect neutral and open internet. And these regulations must be based on the rule of law. We need a multi-stakeholder approach and we need respect for the law because, of course, there are also some negative uh, solutions regarding the internet. 
Someone once said that there is a simple solution to every complex problem, and we that's what we want. We need simple solutions, but they need to be accurate and reliable as well. Thank you, Ambassador. So it's really important to, to regulate, but always not to over-regulate, yeah? because it may slow down the innovation and, in the end, development of the digital world. So it's always very important and very, very good to keep the balance between those two areas. And now I would like to ask Mr. Viktor Smakarov, Special Envoy on Digital Issues at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Latvia, to provide us with your perspective, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would like to go back to your introduction where you shared with us how difficult the pandemic has been for the Polish uh, enterprises and businesses. And I think uh, the Latvian experience has been very much the same. But I think there are interesting upsides to that as well. I'm quite sure that uh, the economic damage from the pandemic would have been even uh, more devastating had our society and businesses not relied on the elements of digital infrastructure, such as uh, widespread access to internet, uh, strongly digitalized public services. So this has prompted, and this is the upside, this has prompted not just the businesses, but also the societies to say, it's actually possible to digitalize much more. So they've been nudged, and they've discovered that it is now not in five or 10 years. So you ask what the challenges are. Uh, I will not tell you all of the uh, digital transformation strategy we have. It's a long document, but I'll give you five. And my main, main point is going to be that for the businesses to digitalize, it's not happening in a vacuum. It's not uh, going to be just about businesses. It's about the society as, as a whole. So, challenge number one for our businesses is actually to adopt digital technologies. The traditional ones, for some reason, it's not happening as fast as we would like, but there are also new technologies coming up, already mentioned, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, big data. We have to learn to use these technologies, otherwise we will not be competitive. The second challenge is about the workforce. Uh, sometimes we have general problems with uh, lack of workforce in numbers, but we also have the, the specific issue of upskilling people to work in enterprises that need to digitalize. This brings me to challenge number three, human capital. It's about skills, such as basic skills. We need to upgrade. In Latvia, this is one of the priorities for us. Uh, mid-level skills, but also we need more ICT experts. Very simple. But it's, just not, it's not just about skills. It's also about values and trust in digital. Without that, skills are not going to be relevant. Without that, people are not going to uh, buy into the drive to digitalize. Number four is connectivity. Now, Latvia is one of the countries uh, with uh, well, some of the best internet. Uh, one in four Latvian households only have mobile broadband. But 5G is coming, it should be coming much faster. The ambition for us is in six years to have at least four Latvian cities uh, with full 5G coverage. So uh, these are, this is number four. And number five is regulation that was already mentioned here. Now for Latvia, as a small country in the European Union, our regulatory environment is basically what, uh, what the EU provides through the uh, single digital market. Uh, digital Markets Act has been already mentioned here. It has to provide uh, fair access and fair competition. Otherwise, the small and medium enterprises will lose out to the big companies. And we hope that uh, this regulation will be adopted next year and we uh, do uh, place all of our hopes uh, into uh, the French presidency of the EU Council. Uh, but also the Artificial Intelligence Act is going to establish rules for what you can and what you cannot do in terms of applications of artificial intelligence. And this is what the businesses absolutely need for them to innovate and for them to dare to implement 
AI in their homes. There are also a number of other regulatory acts coming up in Europe that uh, have this very important uh, impact on the businesses that they have to create more trust in digital, without which businesses will not survive. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. I, I like very much the challenge number one, the relatively slow or low implementation of the latest digital technologies by small and medium-sized businesses, because we see that continuously on the European level. As, as you may know, we do have this the Digital Society and Economy Index, and we are me measure the advance in the digital products and services implementation on the on the side of the member states and if we go deeper into the index we see that small and medium sized enterprises they are quite quite slow even in many countries they are much slower than administration which is a little bit sometimes surprising uh, having said that, it's a great moment because we are in the middle of our discussion. I would like now our technical team uh, to provide us with a video message from the Deputy Prime Minister um, from Russia, Russian Federation. So, the, 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 are we ready? Very good day, dear participants of the United Nations Internet Governance Forum. We all realize that despite the many negative consequences, the pandemic has become the engine of digital transformation around the world, changed the attitude toward technology and influenced the development of the digital economy. People around the world have become more likely to use digital services, more likely to resort on online services. And in Russia, the digital technology industry is achievably developing. Digital transformation is our national development goal and position in STEM education is among the strongest in the world. Our IT industry is represented by tens of thousands of companies and hundreds of thousands of specialists. Our export of software is constantly growing. This year, export of software and services has grown by almost 20 percentages and the powerful incentive system uh, for the IT sector has been built in Russia. Stage by stage, measures to support the development of IT industry are being implemented. As an example, competitive grant awards are organized for IT projects and companies implementing digital solutions. The total amount of grant support is about 4 billion rubles per year. I believe that the further growth and development of IT solutions and the digital economy are impossible without cooperation on a global scale, without the synergy of solutions and, mostly importantly, the development of the international legal framework. As you are all aware, uh, the growth of the investment is uh, always uh, directly related uh, to clear and understandable rules of the game. And I would like to stress the need to speedy development of common approaches uh, to the protection of the personal data on the global scale in order to balance the rights and responsibilities of all parties in the digital environment. Another of the most important areas of activity for us today is to work to remove the existing regulatory barriers and impede the introduction of uh, artificial intelligence technologies into the economy. The issue of ethical regulation in the field of AI is uh, relevant to all over the world. Russia's top priority is uh, human-centric AI that uh, must work uh, for the benefit of society. Uh, Russia recently developed uh, and adopted uh, the Code of Ethics of AI signed by leading companies, uh, universities and foundations. The Code formulates the basic principle of AI use – transparency, trustworthiness, responsibility, reliability, inclusiveness, security, and confidentiality. I would like also to note that the importance of the harmonizing the international legislation in regulation of the global internet and the activities of uh, technology companies. 
In this regard, we note uh, with uh, interest uh, the recent initiative of the United Nations Secretary General to develop a global digital compact. Russia is open to dialogue with all interested states, uh, companies and experts uh, communities. We are very honored uh, to have received uh, UN confirmation that Russia will host the 20th uh, UN Internet Governance Forum in 2025. It will be a great honor for Russia to host the anniversary forum and uh, it is uh, part of recognition of the firm positions of our country in development of the information society and digital technologies. We intend to ensure the broadest participation of all stakeholders in the work uh, of the forum. At the same time, we're sure that uh, the practical outcomes of the forum will guarantee the openness and security of the Internet. I wish all participants a constructive uh, dialogue and fruitful discussion at the forum. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister, for a very interesting perspective. And indeed, uh, Russia will be hosting in 2025 IGF. So there is a quite a nice uh, queue in front of us. It will be next year Ethiopia, then Japan, then we will see, and then Russia. So it's really very interesting. IGF scenario in front of us. Back to our discussions, to our on-stage discussion, let's move a little bit and um, focus on the business side of, of the perspective, uh, from uh, of the digital perspective, such startups as well as small and medium-sized companies, they pre play really very important and extremely important role in digital transformation. Uh, and the crucial in this perspective is, of course, uh, funding. We do have different funding pockets, I would say, and to fully capture the growing demand for their products and services or to invest more in research and development, especially in, in important in the, in the, let's say, newest economies. So it's, it's really important area. So because the time is running very fast, much faster than we, than we expected, so I would like now to, uh, to, to limit your intervention to two, three minutes uh, per person in the same, in the same order. Actually, the, the, there will be question, open question to, to all of our uh, guests on stage um, uh, again. So back, back to the business side. So how, so how can we encourage startups or small and medium-sized enterprises to innovate and to use more digital technologies? That's the question number one. And what find, uh, funding models uh, could you recommend based on your experience from the public money, from the venture capital money, private equity, European programs, your, your individual perspective from your territories or area you're covering? So I would like to start again and give the floor to Minister Julia uh, Alimati. Okay. Thank you again, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, audiences, again, for your patience. First of all, I would like to say uh, we have to recognize today's innovation is often emerge of the startup community. If we dare to exploit this potential for good, we support startup or start from the basics, those who have, uh, when you come to Africa, there are plenty of young people users, so they are very innovative, they can have plenty of innovative ideas, so if you can start from the basic, we can benefit, that's what I believe. Uh, the other thing is in developing nations like Ethiopia, few years before, access to finance, access to reliable, to reliable infrastructure, access to working space were very luxury. Even now, infrastructure is the most being constrained at this time, especially for SMEs to grow in profitable business locally as well as globally. This is uh, the challenge that we are facing. So therefore, both the government and the private sector like local, regional, and global, should invest in infrastructure. This is what we uh, propose, and the investment should also include an investment in power infrastructure. 
Hence, I believe governments should address critical such as the bottleneck, for example, in registration, certification of startup and innovative businesses, the establishment of the innovation fund and its disbursement. So we need to focus from the beginning how it register, how it uh, certifies, and how we attract our innovative businesses uh, from the establishment of their innovation in funding and disbursement. So this issue be, uh, should be addressed, some kind of legislations or similar legal frameworks. So we, sh we need to have a good legal frameworks. So also governments should consider tax and custom related incentives, financial incentives, administrative support and incentives for investors. Even though they have a good ideas, they may not have enough resource or enough finance. So we have to think on their making them free of tax, custom related incentives and financial incentives. This would help to curb financial impediment that SMS and startup will be realized. Government and development partners and Private sectors also expected to establish a system which positively respond to the financial, legal, technical challenge entrepreneurs face in process of realizing their dreams. So another critical factor I would like to mention here is the data innovation. Data and innovation. As you all know, data is at this time a new oil. So it's a new oil that needs the use of new tools, approach to collect, aggregate, analyze, and use it for a benefit of a nation. So this uh, process demands the collab collaboration of all SMEs. So we have to take it in a very serious way. So one of the major strategic approach should be government should be transparent towards data. So if it's an expensive data, so we have to be transparent towards the data. As you know, different government institutions collect and capture traditional data to carry out their mandates. So we have to be live out of the traditions. We have to make it serious. So the data should be any, anyone can access, use, share, and use it for any kind of purpose. So we need to be very transparent. Also policy on access and use of non-traditional data also requires effort from the government side. With this, we can help startups to drive innovation using open data and contribute national development agendas. In general, we have to make our data open to those who have an idea, creative ideas, and who can access it in a very easy way. So for the funding, the second question, should I continue? Yes, yeah, just, just for 30 seconds, if you could just comment the funding. Okay, for funding, uh, as far as I'm coming from the uh, developing country, uh, this is very interesting uh, question. So my response is, would prefer all all because uh, we need to have different options exactly. for our innovators and creativities of their ideas. So I don't know how it works in other nations, but for developing nations like Ethiopia, my response would be all. So it can cause startup ecosystem, weak and most startups struggling to realize their dream due to the shortage of finance. So, so we have to use all the options till to come on the board with the other countries. Yeah, thank That's you very much, we Minister. Can. We will back to that question if, if, if there will be also a time in the last round. So if you could comment a bit more on the investment side would be, would be also great. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, Minister. Now I would like to, uh, to, uh, to turn to the next speaker, President um, Teresa Czerwińska, uh, with a very big experience in finance and in financing activities. So I'm really wondering your perspective on the subject. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. And actually, I would like to pick up when uh, Minister has uh, left, uh, because, because uh, uh, ministers uh, spoke about financing. So uh, well, let me start with uh, saying that uh, different types uh, uh, of financing at different stage of uh, development of the enterprises needed at early stage different uh, type of ta financing and later on uh, we, we, we need different type of financing. So uh, uh, also different sectors require different type of financing and I absolutely agree with the minister who said that we need as a public uh, institutions and policy makers to, uh, to have broad palette of financial instruments to support digitalization uh, for SMEs and, mix, and mix, uh, mid caps uh, and startups to choose uh, from. And um, uh, however, looking at the broader market perspective, uh, we observe the biggest financial uh, bottlenecks in the areas of uh, risk sharing mechanisms, uh, namely instruments like equity and uh, venture debt finance, uh, so precisely among the instruments which uh, are best fit for supporting innovation and driving technological change. So to, addre to address these gaps um, further, exacerbated by pandemic, by the way, uh, the EIB group has developed uh, a dedicated approach and our motto is lending, blending and advising. So it means that we are offering a um, wide palette of um, intermediated products, including loans, guarantees and securitization along with equity and quasi-equity financing. Uh, but what is very important, we are blending our financing with other sources of uh, financing. Uh, for example, capital market instruments and EU grants as well. So uh, to be sure that uh, the financial structure for, is, is fit for, for purpose for, for particular project. And finally, um, uh, on advising, uh, uh, we are offering technical assistance to support our clients to uh, prepare projects to, uh, and we are with our clients from the beginning to the end, from the preparation stage to the end uh, of, of the project to the finalization stage. Uh, so, and our experience it, uh, is that uh, advising and technical assistance is very much needed. And on SME, as uh, very shortly, I just would like to uh, underline that SMEs and uh, meat cups are our absolute priority. And uh, let me give an example. In 2020 alone, the EIB group uh, supported over 420,000 SMEs and meat cups with new financing, employing 4 million people. And uh, support for SMEs uh, accounted for 40% of our lending volume. In absolute terms, uh, it represented uh, almost 31 billion euros annually uh, from uh, around 77 billion euros of our financing as the EIB group. So we are proud that we support SMEs, mid-caps, startups, uh, and uh, we are acting exactly uh, where the, our financing is very much needed at very early stage uh, projects uh, from uh, uh, well-known companies, uh, and also we are supporting uh, high-tech unicorns. Yes, thank you very much for this perspective. And now I would like to, to ask Ms. Uh, uh, Maria Francesca Spatoliciano for answering the same question. So if, are, are startups supported enough and SMEs advanced enough in digital technologies, or maybe there is a time for improvement? Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I think that uh, um, something that was already said on this stage is very important. Uh, we must make startups and small and medium-sized enterprises and micro-enterprises 
more aware of the benefits they can retire from uh, the connectivity, the, the internet, etc. cetera. Uh, but first of all, of course, we have to provide that uh, connectivity. You know that uh, uh, in theory, uh, at least 95% of the world population is within reach of a mobile cellular network. But in practice, we still have, according to the latest report of ITU, 2.9 billion, almost 3 billion people who remain offline, who have not used that opportunity. So awareness and uh, um, you know, more uh, training, more uh, uh, skilled, people uh, who are maybe, uh, you know, potential entrepreneur would reduce that, that gap. But I have to add, I was told in this uh, first day, in day zero and in this first day, that there isn't only skilled or access, there is also a question of affordability. And so SMEs uh, might find uh, that the cost of using the, the digital technologies is too steep. So we need to provide access, but it has to be affordable and it has to be accessible. Now, another thing which is important, of course, is the funding model. And I'm going very fast in all this because time is what it is. Um, of course, in, uh, in, in some uh, uh, countries, uh, um, access to risk capital is easier than in others, as the minister was saying in particular. And uh, where that access is possible, private equities, venture capitals in, step in and help startups and uh, I have here a figure which is telling the venture capital, um, uh, it is estimated the venture capital investment has grown by a factor of 20 since 2002 and could reach uh, 580 billion in 2021. So there is enormous potential. But of course, uh, where these markets are underdeveloped and there isn't that easiness, the development finance institution has to step in, regional development banks and, and the similar institutions. Now we just heard indeed that this is what the EAB is doing with guarantees and blending. But I would say there is also maybe um, a, a little bit too, orthodox, too much orthodoxy in uh, in these kind of operations, and I can tell it because I was with the European Commission for a long time, so you will forgive me if I voice this. And sometimes a, a little bit more of risk taking uh, would be helpful, I think, to invest in in this uh, um, area and in countries which uh, which uh, definitely need the support. So linking, of course, private investors with the companies is is fundamental, and there are many ways to do that. Um, but some are, uh, are more advisable maybe and speedier, uh, keeping the pace with the dynamic of this sector. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I just would like to mention that, uh, for example, in Poland at the moment, 70% of the money invested on the venture capital mar market, they are public money. So it's really the support from the, from the government is really important, not only on the maybe very first stage as a startups and small grants, but also on the, on the little bit higher t tickets, yeah, how we are calling. Uh, now I would like to turn to, to Mr. Uh, ambassador because I, I've been, uh, yes, we will be having a time uh, to wear uh, our headphones, uh, headsets. And um, I, I remember a few, few months ago there was a very interesting conference in France, VivaTech, and two subjects present on the conference was uh, like uh, digital technologies and the financing side, financial side, and supporting startups. So if you could answer the question or maybe mix your intervention having in mind those uh, two areas. Je vais répondre toujours en français, toujours avec l'excellente traduction. Mais très très brièvement, d'abord comme l'a rappelé madame la ministre. Thank you very much. Well, as the minister has said, the country is first and foreign, foremost responsible for the establishment of the necessary infrastructure, and especially in the developing countries. We need to ensure access to internet, access to free, open and safe infrastructure. So this is 
the united internet that we have in mind. The kind of internet that is truly open and free. Because these days we are often confronted with the internet that is not completely free, that is um, under the surveillance of operators. But going back to the banking services and the sources of financing, well, the important economic and financing issues need to be tackled by uh, public institutions in cooperation with uh, private actors. And France, as an EU member state, also offers venture capital. But the government uh, has not become a risk taker. What you need are special experts on venture capital, but still a degree of uh, public-private collaboration is indispensable. So you've mentioned high-tech unicorns. These type of companies require a completely different uh, financing tools. We would also like to be able to support SMEs in their digital transformation because they offer the greatest number of jobs. These companies usually do not have sufficient resources to employ experts, advisors, consultants on digital uh, transformation. And so there are public policies implemented in France that help SMEs uh, gain access to the necessary expertise so that they can tap into the potential of the digital transformation. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I couldn't agree more because uh, just to also give you an example from Poland, we are in the middle of, of, um, of having implemented probably the biggest, as we know, in Europe at the moment, uh, uh, the project. We call it Open, uh, uh, op open Education Network. So we are connecting 30,000 schools to the high-speed internet and also providing the access to the, uh, to the network in, in that perspective also as a bandwidth for more startups, maybe more innovation and creating more, more value. So now there is a time for Mr. Viktor Smakarovs and your uh, comment on that question on the investment side or business side. Thank you very much, Chair. Well, first of all, uh, you asked how uh, we can encourage startups uh, to innovate up. We don't need uh, to encourage startups to innovate. We need to encourage people to create startups. That's the uh, absolutely key uh, thing. Do people want to do this? Do they want to risk their time and energy? Uh, do they want to do it in my country? That's what I, as a Latvian digital envoy, am interested in. And I'm happy that the answer very often is yes. People want to innovate in my country, become uh, part of our uh, uh, economic system, to, so to say. So you need good conditions for that. As for the non-startup uh, SMEs, uh, it's a different ballgame. We've talked about that. And uh, you need, very much like Ambassador Verdier said, uh, a set of policies uh, to inform, to offer direct and indirect incentives such as subsidies or requirements for qualifying for some of the support programs. Uh, some of the things that we do in, in Latvia is, the, uh, and this is a European, uh, basically, model, the digital innovation hubs that guide entrepreneurs uh, towards employing technology, uh, uh, promotes digitalization. For example, they will create uh, uh, a digital, uh, they will establish, a, create a digital audit for a small or medium enterprise or help learn about digital solutions. So this is where uh, uh, the uh, public authorities have an important role to play. As for financing, and I have to uh, uh, be quite honest with you, uh, we asked, preparing for this conversation, uh, people from the actual ICT sector, what they think about funding uh, in Latvia. And their answer was, well, startups, all funding models work, depends on the situation. Uh, Everything goes as long as the investment conditions are favorable for the startup, such as, well, adequate uh, equity sharing. Uh, uh, in, the investor should not be toxic. Uh, so range, ranges of, 
of options for the non-startup SMEs for them to adopt digital? Uh, again, it depends on lots of factors. Uh, sometimes the, the SMEs uh, will have easier access to uh, credit line because they are established uh, uh, companies, uh, unlike, very, very much unlike the startups. Uh, the venture capital that was mentioned here, uh, it's good for businesses uh, with high growth potential, funding needs for developing a product, rapid growth ambitions. Again, for startups, so this is probably uh, uh, the right solution. Uh, interestingly, in Latvia, uh, when I talked to some of the uh, dig uh, ITC uh, 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 businesses, they're not very much interested in uh, foreign investment. Uh, they talk about organic uh, growth. So again, they like what they, what they do. They want to keep doing what they like. Uh, but that, of course, is just part of the picture. Uh, and of course, uh, grants have uh, been mentioned here. Everyone likes them. I don't think we can cover everything with grants. And public investment, again, uh, from what we hear from the sector, it depends. It mostly works. Uh, in areas where private investment fails or is not sufficient. I'll stop here. Yes, thank you very much. Such we are running out of time, but I think that uh, the discussion is extremely interesting, so I will uh, go ahead anyway, and we are in the front of the last part of our panel called voluntary uh, um, uh, commitments or or, or comments. So if there is anything else you would like to leave us with or add or comment, so please do so. Just, just a short statement or message from your perspective, 30 to 60 seconds per person, and yeah, starting from the minister. Thank you so much. Just I would like to add one thing that I didn't include. Uh, the government of Ethiopia recently have legally established a national innovation fund uh, and recognize like angel investment, venture capital, equitable capital domestic um, for the startup legislation. So as you understand, private investors are focusing on the less risky. So the government want to include the high risk uh, innovative ideas. So we establish uh, on that. So we are working with the National Bank and Commercial Bank to avail their 5% uh, for the startup using the intellectual property as a collateral. This is what I would like to add. And the other thing is, as we are uh, the second host, the next host in Ethiopia, I would like to invite all of you to Ethiopia uh, to have a very good host at this. This is what I would like to add. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minister, for the invitation. So I hope that we'll do our best to visit Ethiopia next year. Miss President, your perspective, 30 seconds to one minute. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the European Investment Bank, we fully recognize the benefits offered by uh, digitalization and as demonstrated by the recent pandemic crisis, digitalization is uh, absolutely instrumental to ensure robust and sustainable growth for the decades to come. And uh, without doubt, the world ahead of us is, is, digital, it is digital. And uh, I would like to announce that in the course of next year, we will explore ways to better define, measure, and report on digitalization across all EIB lending areas. And this exercise ultimately aims at researching investment gaps and redirecting the EIB lending to better address these gaps guiding future EIB support for digitalization. And I'm proud to say that our support matters for EU's technological leadership. In 2020 alone, out of uh, 52 European venture-baked high-tech unicorns, 28 were support by the European Investment Fund. So we strongly believe that our continuous effort to better capitalize on digital technologies and digital skills will bring tangible results, better quality of jobs, but what is most important, better quality of life for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. President. Ms. Patoliziano, your comment on that question, 30 seconds. 
Thank you. Yes, the UN, as you all know, is committed through the roadmap for technological cooperation of the Secretary General to an internet which connects, respects, and protects. And we do that through a number of multi-stakeholders, venues, we call them roundtables, and, and we engage all the participants in the IGF and many others. <laughs> but I would like, in conclusion, to, uh, as I promised in the beginning, uh, say a word about the Global Digital Compact that the Secretary General proposes to conclude in the year 2023. This should outline shared principles for an open, free, and secure digital future for all and address very complex, uh, no hiding there, <laughs> digital issues. Uh, for instance, uh, reaffirming the fundamental commitment to connecting the unconnected and leaving no one behind, avoiding the fragmentation of the internet because it is a global public good, providing people with options as to how their data is used, and also, very importantly, the application of human rights we enjoy offline, also online. And finally, promoting a trustworthy internet by introducing accountability criteria for all the actors, public and private, uh, for discrimination, misleading content, and all the abuses which unfortunately can happen. So with this uh, objective in mind, we call on everyone. There will be very broad consultations, of course, uh, to build uh, this kind of consensus. And of course, the IGF can give a very important contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Ambassador. Well, one last idea. Can you imagine a, a world, a digital world, without Linux, MySQL, Apache, um, OpenStreetMap, Wikipedia? <laughs> So, for everyone, even companies and startups, we should protect, promote, encourage, and maybe finance digital commons. And that's very helpful for everyone. Exactly. Open startups, open source is also a very important segment. And Mr. Makarovs? Uh, well, I've been talking about my country uh, most of the time today. Uh, this is the part for international commitment. And we will work through the uh, UO, with, with the UN system, uh, through ECOSOC and technology facilitating mechanism to share our experiences and knowledge and how technology could be better uh, uh, helping to achieve sustainable development goals uh, through the 10 member group. There is a Latvian expert working there. We will uh, continue supporting that. Uh, we will share our expertise and best practices uh, uh, in the UN group of friends on digital technologies and group of friends on e-governance and cyber security groups. And lastly, and more broadly, uh, we will, together with like-minded countries, uh, advocate principles of digital governance, governance that protect human dignity and human rights, without which uh, sustainable digital growth is not possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, just to very shortly conclude, so one thing is for certain, the progress of digital transformation in all aspects will continue and we need to become more agile at adapting technologies, legislation or stimulate investment. At the same time, people should always be in the center of our uh, activities. I would like to thank again our speakers for the truly excellent contribution and for sharing with us here in Katowice their thoughts. Sorry for being a little bit late, but it was word, I hope, to have us a little bit longer on stage. I would like to thank the audience and for your attention, and I wish you for a, I wish you actually the fruit, fruitful conference. Thank you again, and let's give a big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you.